Welcome to the Web Talk series Corona Crisis Lessons for the Future of Cities presented by Körber Foundation. With this series, we want to look at how cities came through the Corona Crisis and what role digital technologies played during the coping with the crisis. We will talk to experts, crisis managers and decision makers from cities in Germany, Europe and the world. They will provide insights into the measures on site and we will look at the effects on society, on education, culture, business and urban life. But now let's switch to the lessons for the future of cities. I'm pleased that Peter Beer is the moderator for this series. Peter Beer is an expert on digitization and a strategy consultant. He co-founded and managed renewed technology conferences such as the Cognitive Cities Conference and ThinksCon. Thank you very much for your attention. Please enjoy today's episode. Um, thanks so much for, be for being here. Uh, John Paul Farmer uh, is the CTO of New York City, Chief Technology Officer, um, one of the you know, few bigger cities that has one of these roles, I guess, uh, globally speaking. German cities certainly often do not. Um, this is the first installment of a new video interview series we're doing uh, with the Kerber Foundation to explore how cities respond to the challenges of the um, corona crisis and specifically what different approaches are there that differ a little bit from the global strategies like washing your hands and sheltering in place, which are kind of the same everywhere, more or less. We were really interested to see and to explore what local challenges and opportunities there are, what works for your context that, may, that others may be, uh, may be able to learn from. Um, thanks so much for taking the time. Of course, very happy, very happy to be here. Uh, why don't I start off with a quick presentation and then we'll Perfect. have a discussion. Let's do that. So I will, I will share my screen. So I'll give you a quick overview of how New York City has addressed COVID-19 through the application of technology. Obviously, this is just a few different ways that we've worked. It's, it's not an exhaustive list. And uh, I'll start by giving you an introduction to the office and what it is that we do, this mayor's office of the CTO here in New York. I'll describe the internet master plan that we released earlier this year, how we've then built upon that with a tablet program that is helping vulnerable older New Yorkers, especially those who are low income. And then finally, I'll discuss uh, something that we just launched a few days ago in late May, which is a solicitation for partnerships for others to join us in closing the digital divide. So the introduction. We use technology, innovation, new thinking, new approaches to make New York City future ready. And when we think about future ready, that means both taking advantage of the opportunities, but also guarding against the risks and potential harms that technology could bring to bear. We also think about the fact that too often the most vulnerable among us get overlooked and that government and progress doesn't always serve everybody equally. And so equity and fairness is core to the way we approach these issues, the way we approach technology, the way we try to use it to improve our city. And there are four different categories of work in which we're, we're doing this. The first is universal broadband, making sure that everybody has access to a, an internet connection. They can get online, at home, on the go, at their workplace, in public spaces. Because we've seen that in the 21st century, connectivity is as critical to New York City as electricity was in the prior century. The second area is digital services. And this builds on top of the fact that as more people get connected, we can now deliver essential services to them in a way that is faster, uh, seamless, they can access it at home. This is something that we were already working on as a city, but now we recognize the urgency of delivering digital services at a time when in-person services are simply not an option. The third is innovation, using new approaches, uh, looking at open innovation, inviting others to participate and help us solve these hard problems, not doing it alone. And the last is tech policy focusing on the role that policy at the local, uh, the state, and the federal level play in informing the way technology gets used in New York City. A big part of this is a focus on protecting people's digital rights, ensuring that human rights in the internet age are respected. So I'll jump into the first 
issue that I want to, want to talk about, which is the Internet Master Plan. In January of 2020, Mayor de Blasio released the Internet Master Plan, which was the first of its kind in the United States. It's a comprehensive roadmap for how we can close the digital divide in the months and years to come. And it recognizes that there is no silver bullet, that we need a portfolio approach. And that means a portfolio approach that recognizes the differences that we have in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Number one, recognizing that the needs in Midtown Manhattan, which is very much a global central business district, may be different from the needs in a Sunnyside, Queens, a residential neighborhood. And so looking at the differences in the demographics, in the built environment, and the needs of different communities in our city allows us to recognize that there is no silver bullet, that we need lots of different approaches, and that government alone isn't going to do this. This is going to be a collaboration with the private sector, with community groups, with academia, and that together we've each got a role to play. It does recognize that the city is going to take uh, and should take a more active role, that this is the responsibility of the city to make sure that all its people are connected and have access to opportunity, access to education, access to uh, job employment uh, opportunities, access to healthcare, which is something that we're recognizing now is more important than ever. So whereas uh, when we released this plan in January, a lot of the focus was on the, uh, the fact that this is the morally right thing to do, to include every person and every family, it's now crystal clear that this is not just the morally right thing to do, it's also a public health issue that we need to make sure that everyone is connected because if my neighbor has to go out because they have to go uh, cash their check or they have to go uh, purchase groceries in person because they can't order them, they have to go pick up a medication at a store because they can't have it delivered to them because they can't get online, that affects all of us. So the Internet Master Plan is our foundational document that lays out this vision. Uh, it can be accessed at nyc.gov slash CTO. Uh, and we hope uh, that others can learn from it and we hope to continue to iterate and improve it over time. Building on top of the Internet Master Plan uh, during the COVID crisis and the response to it, we saw that there are certain groups that are especially vulnerable. So we know that older adults are more vulnerable to the virus, so their health is more at risk. We also know that low-income people are more vulnerable as well. And so we looked at NYCHA, which is the New York City Housing Authority. This is the, the public housing uh, communities here in New York City. And we looked at what we could do to help close the digital divide to allow more people to access essential services and information from their homes. And so we, uh, the mayor announced a 10,000 uh, internet connected tablets being delivered to residents in these NYCHA developments over the age of 62. These are uh, senior citizens who are living alone or living only with other seniors. Uh, and so we focused on some of the most vulnerable among us. And what we've done there is identified where we see the overlap between uh, COVID incidents and also low broadband access. And we focused there, we focused on some of these communities that are historically under-resourced and too often overlooked. And, uh, and so far we've seen some incredible um, some incredible stories coming out of this just in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, people using this for um, obviously communicating with their friends and family, uh, also for um, paying their rent so they don't have to go carry cash somewhere, which obviously right now is something we don't want folks doing, but also can be dangerous even in normal times. Uh, we've seen people accessing healthcare, which is exactly what we want. People being able to get an appointment with their cardiologist and have a conversation without having to get on public transportation, go to a hospital, sit in a waiting room. That's exactly what we want to see happen. That's what we are seeing happen. So we are looking forward to uh, not just following this program in the near term, but over the course of many months to understand how people are using this technology, how it's changing their lives, uh, how they're being safer because of it. And we've got, really importantly, we've got supportive programming associated with this. So it's not simply giving somebody a device and then walking away. It's giving them the device and the connectivity, but also the support, uh, free classes, uh, free coaching on how to use it. And that's really critical. And, uh, and we'd encourage anybody else who's trying to close the digital divide to think about the human element as well. So the last uh, bit of what we're doing that I'm gonna describe in a little bit of detail is the Universal Solicitation for Broadband, NYCHA Rapid Response, RFEI. RFEI stands for Request for Expressions of Interest. Now that is a mouthful, I recognize, but it's as important as the name is long. 
the universal solicitation for broadband is the commitment that the city made in the internet master plan to open up and invite and solicit good ideas to help close this digital divide. And we decided uh, for these, these reasons that, uh, that folks who are lower income, who are living in our public housing communities are some of the most vulnerable among us, we decided to start there. So instead of waiting to do it all at once, to think of all of the different assets that the city has available, all the different communities that we wanna serve, we said, let's start with one. And so we're starting by asking the world, anyone, anywhere, to come to us between now and June 30th with ideas for how they can help us close the digital divide in our public housing communities. This is open to anybody and everybody. It doesn't matter how big or how small. It doesn't matter what sector you're in. Uh, ideas are coming in between now and June 30th. People can submit them at nyc.gov slash CTO. And we're going to work with the best ideas to install them uh, quickly in the coming months so that we can get better connectivity for more people in our public housing developments. So all of this that I've described shows the critical nature of connectivity underpinning the delivery of information and services during this crisis and in the future. So we want to make New York City future ready. We want to help New Yorkers respond and stay healthy during the COVID-19 crisis. And to do that, we recognize that we have to start closing this digital divide. Thanks. This is brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, this is fantastic. This is brilliant. And also, first of all, this is a really ambitious plan and it's really great to see this. Um, I'm not aware of many cities who have something that even in the ballpark, you might know of some, like I'm, I'm really not aware. Um, I think there's like a few things there that you tied together really nicely that really like stand out to me. Like, first of all, that this is almost like a forcing function that will lead to leapfrogging in innovation and public service delivery. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's a, not the best occasion, but it is an occasion to do that. Um, then how you tap into this, how you use open innovation practices to tap into what seems to be a very broad pool of talent. Of course, there, there's like New York City has tremendous talent and tremendous, a tremendous tech sector and a tremendous civil society sector. But you're deliberately asking very broadly, if I understand this correctly, to That's allow right. all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of inputs. Um, that to me you know, alone is like is something that's really a rare beast out in the wild to see such an open call. Have you, like judging from the, the you know, the early stages, um, have you seen novel ideas come in so far or is it so far still the obvious solutions and the obvious contenders? Were there any surprises so far? Without so far, it's, too early. it's, it's yeah. too early to say. We, we actually released that a matter of days ago, not even a week ago. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, so, okay. so we're waiting to see what happens. Um, but we are inspired by our prior experiences. We've right. done open innovation calls mm -hmm. uh, around, for example, last year around cybersecurity for small businesses. So a hard problem uh, when you're looking at 230,000 small businesses in New York City, the vast majority of them have fewer than 10 people that work there. Right. So they don't have expertise. They don't really understand uh, technology super well on average. And yet you're asking them to secure people's data and make sure that they're doing that correctly. And so it's a hard problem, uh, and we asked the world, and we really mean that. We, we put it out through the networks, uh, not just here in the United States, but mm -hmm. globally, and we ended up with 169 ideas, submissions. Already? Submitted ideas. This was yeah. last year for the cybersecurity right. okay, right. okay. challenge. And we ended up with 169 ideas, and those ideas came from 77 different cities right. in 18 different countries on five different continents. Wow, and so okay. We seen, uh, that that led to three different winners that were selected and are in the process of, of being deployed and piloted and tested. And so we've seen this work. And now we're trying to apply it to a new problem. Uh, and that problem is, is connectivity and not just connectivity, but connectivity in the age of COVID yeah. when it's more important than ever. But it's, it's, it's interesting to me, not but, and it's interesting to me to see how you basically go back to, you almost go back to first principles by saying, mm -hmm. first we need to close the digital divide. And then we can talk about all these like added value uh, so, uh, services, even though they might not be as sexy, they're super important. Um, that, that is really interesting to me. Um, is it just an impression or is there your personal, like does this carry like your signature of like having worked in civic tech before? You, I think you came to New York City via Microsoft, but maybe not via the branch of Microsoft that is best known uh, in the public, right? You you ran their uh, civic tech division right. or program. So I, 
I joined Microsoft at a great time. I left yeah. the Obama White House in 2014 and I joined Microsoft uh, just as Satya Nadella was coming in as CEO. Right. And uh, what was great about that moment at Microsoft is that he and Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, made a choice to invest in tech for good, in right. civic tech. And that meant they built a network around right. the United States uh, of people on the ground embedded in communities. Mm -hmm. And that was an opportunity to show that technology doesn't have to be the hero, right. uh, it can be the helper. Technology can help solve problems, but in and of itself, it doesn't do much. And yeah. so embedding with the civic tech community, being collaborative, being supportive, it was just a really, well, it was a pleasure to do that every day. Right. And we were able to produce a lot of, a lot of good. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of companies would do well to take the approach that it's, you can do well and do good at the same time. Yeah. You can do good work in communities that helps people. And by doing that, you're actually winning allies, you're winning a yeah. user base. Uh, that you might not have otherwise. And so it's, it's not a choice between the two. It's that you can actually create uh, a stronger business when yeah. you engage deeply at a local level. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really, really strong point. Um, but so if I understand this correctly, you're working very closely, not just with the tech industry, but also with civil society in this and with the local tech community, however you might define that. Um, can you speak a little bit about the type of engagement there is or how that works in the day to day? So quick question, do you mean uh, just generally in my role or are you speaking specifically about the projects that we've discussed so far? Well, like how, how do you, like in all the things you do when you go, you know, remotely probably to work right now every morning and you have meetings around COVID and how to use digital tools to get through this crisis and maybe come yeah. out a stronger, more resilient city afterwards. Um, what role or what types of engagement do you see with civil society? Like, how do you engage with them? Um, how does, just how does that work in the day to day? If, I know it's a, it's a vague question, but um, yeah, I'm not I sure how to better ask it. I think it's really important to recognize that each sector of society has its superpowers. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that, that government um, does really well mm -hmm. and other things that uh, other parts of our society um, can step up and do and and in some cases do better than government could. And so when you look at what civil society can do, being viewed as a, a neutral, not uninterested, that's the wrong word, but a, a neutral third party that is bringing people together around an issue with, without any stake in it, it's yeah. something you hope that people would look at government as, but they don't always. Right. Um, there's, there's often a little bit of concern about what the angle is, why is, why is a, a, any, Part of a government asking me to do this. Uh, there are sometimes concerns around um, government having access to certain types of data, mm -hmm. whereas people are more comfortable with uh, some organization, civil society, or in academia mm -hmm. uh, having access to data with certain rules around it, make sure it's really time bound and really only being used for a certain purpose. So that's another area where um, we've been collaborating even during the COVID crisis is working with uh, academics uh, right. and um, there are some great folks at uh, Harvard, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, just to name a few, that are doing a lot of modeling, not just of the disease itself and the spread of it, but of mobility data, for example. So understanding mobility data to help us understand our communities here in New York City mm -hmm. and to understand, you know, we're a very diverse place and 800 different languages are spoken in New York City. It's really incredible. But that also means that there are some communities that are more likely to speak a language other than English. And what if we're not communicating well with a certain community? Right. And sometimes we can see that in the mobility data. So that mobility data can inform our responses and help us understand where could we do better. And that's data that is, is sensitive. Uh, a lot of this is coming from private companies like Facebook and others. Um, and they're sharing it with academics. Mm -hmm. So those academics can then do uh, a quick run on it, apply the appropriate kinds of digital rights protections to ensure that nobody's privacy is being violated, uh, and then share the appropriate level of granularity with mm -hmm. the cities and the states and the country so that those governments can, can take action. So it's, that a, is it's fascinating. playing the role uh, that we can. That, that to me is a fascinating uh, constellation where companies might collect the data, share with academia, academics then do the number crunching essentially, and then share it back with the state to, mm -hmm. to, to serve that particular function. Um, 
have you done this before or is this like the first time this is tried because it seems like it's a great way to sidestep so many of the implicit issues that's a great question have we tried? this is the first that i've done it in this role okay. I, i i doubt that it's the first that it's happened but certainly people are recognizing the value of it now in, in a way that i think previously it just wasn't as necessary yeah, yeah. Uh, it's fantastic and now we see that there there really are there's data out there that can be very, very helpful, yeah. but the, the need to make sure that we are not overstepping and we are not in the process of trying to solve this problem today, creating new problems down the road. Yeah. And I think that data, data ownership, uh, data usage is, is one very good example of that, where we need to make sure that we use it in a way that's effective, mm -hmm. but that we don't throw out the rule book because the rule right. book's there for a reason there's a reason that we want to make sure that we protect people's privacy right and so we want to keep doing that, uh, but at the same time figure out how we can do this in a way that that allows allows us to get access to insights in real right. time so we can take the best steps possible during the COVID crisis yeah that's fantastic and um, as a cto i think you you probably have counterparts in like the the major u.s cities um probably less so in smaller cities and maybe less so overseas in many places um, is there like a formal or informal exchange with your counterparts in other parts of the country, other parts of the world where you kind of, you know, trade insights in a formalized or just informalized way? Do you have like an open, like, you know, chat channel somewhere with like the other CTOs? So there are certainly informal channels, uh, just a lot of relationships that have been built over the years. Um, about a year and a half ago, New York City teamed up with Amsterdam and Barcelona right. to create the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. And that started with three cities and it's now grown to over 50 cities worldwide. And that's a fantastic place for CTOs, uh, chief data officers, leaders in how technology is used to make their communities future ready can come together um, primarily to discuss that issue of digital rights. How are we making sure that uh, human rights are being respected in the internet age? The internet itself is a safe uh, place uh, for everyone to be. Yeah. But at the same time, it's an opportunity for us to stay, to stay in touch. And so that then uh, can be a platform for other conversations and it's a place where we do interact on a regular basis. Right. And it's certainly a place where especially smaller cities can really learn from the heavy lifting that only the, the bigger cities can, can manage to pull off. Um, and you can see like the Cities Coalition like shows up all over my radar. It's like, it's, it's everywhere. People are really aware of that, which is fantastic. Like, uh, Great. It's really, really good. And no, yeah. thank you so much for your work. Um, we're already like almost out of time and I don't want to keep you from um, saving the city. Uh, <laughs> you have a full plate. Um, so maybe just, just as a last, uh, last question, um, in all the things you've been trying out during this crisis and with the digital divide um, program, uh, NYCHA and all that, were there any surprises to you? Was there anything where you go like, oh, I really was not expecting this and this is fantastic or, you know, could have worked really well, could have not worked yeah. at all, but just like any, anything that you were not expecting at all? Yeah, uh, I mean, one, <laughs> I'll take you very literally, on the connected devices program where we've been deploying these um, to older adults in, uh, in lower income um, housing developments, one person that we spoke with really wanted to use it for parrot research. He, he loves parrots, the birds, and, uh, That was his thing, you know? We knew that people would use it for, for health. We knew people would use it to talk to family. We didn't know that someone would go this deep into parrots. Um, so that was surprising. But I think the thing that surprised me the most, I guess, is in the transition to everyone working remotely. Uh, the social component is so critical that mm -hmm. it's very easy when you're seeing people in person, whether that be in an office, uh, for a happy hour after work, just for an in-person meeting, it's very easy to overlook the social component and the, the human element mm -hmm. uh, and the ways that we connect with one another mm -hmm. in the normal course of daily life mm -hmm. uh, and the ways that makes us better and more effective at what we do. And so recognizing that we've had to adjust, we've had to figure out how to be social uh, through our screens, uh, I think that's something that uh, I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about before mm -hmm. and now is, is very clear and something that I think will stick with me as we continue working like this um, for the time being, but even as we move back into uh, something more normal in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. That was uh, really fantastic. Um, I learned a lot, wish we had like more time, could have chatted for like hours, but um, 
uh, obviously that's not not an option. Um, this is, has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Peter. Take care. Take care.